What up, community? Welcome to this episode of the Travel With Meaning Podcast. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest. She's a lawyer turned full-time travel blogger and author. She's a three-time, that's right, three-time TEDx speaker, a five-time Amazon bestseller, two-time award-winning travel journalist. She also has been featured in outlets like Forbes, The Washington Post, and ABC News. She's also the solo female traveler behind Jen on a Jet Plane. With over 290,000 and growing social media followers. Let's say what up to Jen. Thanks for joining us. What up? Thanks for having me. Jen, where are you in the world? I am in sunny Puerto Rico. Oh, wow. That sounds amazing. So, listen, I just read all your accolades, which is pretty impressive and pretty rad. Um, I, I followed along on your story for quite some time, and I've, I've, I hate the word like social stock because it sounds creepy, but like social cheered, okay, we'll go that way. Like I, I'm one of those people that loves this travel stoke and I love watching others as much as I like to travel. I love when people like get high off travel, right? Not during travel, but on travel. And <laughs> you're one of those people that it's been really cool to watch how your career has taken off. And, you know, from, from your book that you self-published 12 trips in 12 months, kind of was this whole big thing. So I, again, I alluded to all these big accolades, but I'm going to come back to that stuff. Can we come back to that? Yes. All right. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Philadelphia. Really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now growing up, what was travel for you? Did your family travel? Did you have any connection travels at all? Yeah, I think travel was mainly local. So we would go out to Amish country and, you know, it was really fascinating that they had better ice cream than we did uh, because it was all hand done and fresh and that they had, you know, things like quilting, you know, things that I found interesting already from the get-go, which probably describes my really weird taste as an adult and why there's so many things where I'm like, this is fun. And people are like, really? And I'm like, yeah, um, I like learning. And my mom was a teacher. And so, um, you know, I remember going to the Frank Lloyd Wright house in Pennsylvania when I was younger. So there were a lot of things also that made me realize that just because you are in a certain state doesn't mean that you can't still travel locally. And I think a lot of people think that they have to go to Europe or to Asia to really have something that counts as traveling. But I learned early on how many things there are to see, even within, you know, a three hour radius of your own house. I mean, we could end the podcast here. You just crushed everything I'm about. So, wow. Um, let's, as we say, let's unpack this a little bit because First off, you sound like you were just a curious kid, right? You wanted to learn, you wanted to explore, you wanted to see. But I love that you already had that lens. I don't know if you got this as a kid, the lens of like travel doesn't mean going far. And I'm going to I'm going to do one of my favorite things. Do you know what the dictionary definition of travel is? I don't. I can guess it would be to, you know, transport yourself somewhere you haven't been before or somewhere new. You would think that. But according to our friends in the dictionary, it's to go from one place to another, generally over a long distance. But what you just said was kind of the flip of that. And the thing that I, I like to talk about is coming through this pandemic, we can all realize traveling doesn't mean going far, right? It can mean looking at your neighborhood differently. So you had this idea and you had this curiosity as a kid. So some of these other road trips that you had growing up, that, that kind of like led this idea for wanting to travel or did you always know you wanted to be a lawyer? Like where did this all kind of come from? Yeah, I actually think for a long time, I thought maybe I wanted to be like a pop star slash singer. Um, <laughs> but you still can. You can. Yeah, you never say never. Um, but that was just as a child, you know, growing up, I think definitely law was set in terms of it being a prestigious career, it being something that a lot of people expected me to go into mm. uh, because of the activities I was involved in. And so travel wasn't really... It wasn't really until I was almost done with law school that I realized that I'd gone through seven years of advanced education and I'd never done a study abroad program uh, and that I'd missed out on that opportunity because so many other people did take their education and that that time to have these special programs, the special funding, things like that. So actually, right before I left law school, I uh, I took a special course that it required me enrolling for like a spring semester course, a couple of months on international relations, and then I ended up 
volunteering to work with the Australian Law Reform Commission in Sydney for a summer. And that was kind of my version of studying abroad. I got to go based on funding that the school provided that helped pay for my, you know, stipend of, of living, which didn't cover much because Australia was expensive. Um, <laughs> Um, but it was just a really wonderful experience. I went for about six weeks and that was great because I was also working there professionally. I got to really see what it was like to live somewhere um, different aside from the U.S. rather than just visit and be there for an extended period of time away from everybody I knew. And, and that was a wonderful experience. So I'm happy I did that. And then it wouldn't be until many years after that, after I'd finally got some space in practicing law and got bank holidays at the very least and wasn't working, you know, Christmas and Thanksgiving, because that's how it was when I started. And then I realized I could at least travel for short distances or short periods of time while I was still practicing law. I want to find out a little bit more about this trip you took with your mom. Mm -hmm. And was there any moments on that trip for you that really stand out as maybe planting seeds for future trips, maybe opening your eyes even more? That was your first time going really abroad into Europe? Yes. So because we had really done a lot of local trips, trips around the East Coast, things like that. So this was my first time flying overseas. It was my mom's first time going to Europe, you know, and she was uh, older at the time in her late 30s, I would say. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a big deal for both of us. It was a lot of money that she spent at a time where she didn't really necessarily have it, but she knew that she wanted to commemorate the occasion. She still talks about it as one of the best trips she's had um, ever. And I would say two big big moments. There was a moment when we were in Italy and we were eating the food that was provided to us by the tour people. And it was like the equivalent of frozen peas and ham. And I remember being like, I cannot believe that we are sitting here in the world's best food city. Like we were in Rome and we're eating like frozen peas and ham. Like this is disgusting. We should be ashamed of ourselves. Um, and I remember like in encouraging her to step out and us going and finding them like little hole in the wall, which of course, literally anywhere that you find Italy is going to be amazing. Uh, and so that was a really great experience and showed us that, you know, we could do things independent on our own and actually come out better than what everybody else had planned for us. We didn't have to kind of go to the beat of their drum. We can go to our own. And then we also went to Stonehenge, which was an unplanned day trip that we took from the UK because at that point I had been getting bold. I had been, you know, getting us around on public transport. And I was like, I think I can manage this train to get us there. It says it's like a direct shot like it's supposed to be really easy this is all in English like this feels like we're gonna be okay and so we went and it, it's such a magnificent type of place anything like that where you have these kind of ancient figures and and these um these really carefully calculated stones like with the pyramids or with Chichen Itza um, it's just almost mystical to see and to marvel at how it was set up and how precise it is and how people were able to move stones that heavy um, so we just really enjoyed the day going out there and having our own little adventure you know guessing about what aliens did or didn't do in, in the process. Um, and it's just a lot of fun. Um, and so that was, there were two moments during that high school trip that really stood out and made me realize, A, that you should absolutely never eat anything in a foreign country that is not like the most delicious local food there. Like do not waste not even a meal, just always eat delicious things when you're traveling. That's the best part of traveling. And then also um, that you can take yourself to see these things. It doesn't have to be with somebody holding your hand the whole way and that it's not complicated to get around. Like public transportation is made for public use. It's made to be comprehensible by the general people. It's not made to be super complicated. It's not made to be beyond, you know, it's not made to be something you have to sit there and puzzle over and figure out. Like it should be really simple. And so with just some research, you know, really planning ahead of time, having some kind of resource for me at the time, it was a book. Now it's, you know, usually advanced research. It, it can really be easy for you to get around and to feel accomplished because you've taken your yourself somewhere new and you're experiencing something amazing and different oh my god you're like the dream to have on a tour because you're so interested and curious at the same time you're like where did she go is she still with her <laughs> <laughs> so it's like as the tour guide you're like holy crap she's gone again but you know listen kudos for you to like want to step outside of that and I, and I really just love that so 
where and when did this idea for 12 for 12 come together? 12 trips, 12 months. You were a lawyer at the time. You were going to turn 30. How long did you sit on this idea? What was the moment that it would like became real? Like, tell us all about this. Yeah, it wasn't brewing for very long. It just really came out of me. I had taken birthday trips uh, a couple of years before then. I realized I wanted to start my birthdays on January 3rd. So it coincides with the beginning of the year. And I wanted to start that new year off in a you know celebratory commemorative way. And I found that travel was a great way to do that. Because maybe I wouldn't remember who showed up to what party VIP style, you know, I went to college in Miami, and that was a big deal who has the sparklers and the cake and what club are you in and none of that would really matter. But I would always remember that I spent my 28th birthday in Barcelona, or my 29th birthday in Thailand volunteering with elephants, you know, things like that, or in Athens, you know, seeing the Parthenon. So I would always, um, I, I liked birthdays as a way to commemorate the new year with something amazing and to start the new year off on a high note and to really mark how far you've come in a way that you'll always remember. And travel, I think, does that. It's hard that you track. Um, <laughs> but the 29th birthday that I spent in Athens when I was there, normally I'm, I'm one of the people who's like, you know, you get a day for your birthday. I'm not going to expand it for a full month or have all these many celebrations or things like that. I never done that. And so I thought I kind of earned because I'd been so considerate about everybody and I'd only taken up 24 hours for my birthday for like 29 birthdays up until then, I'd kind of earned the right to do a more big, you know, blowout kind of celebration for my 30th. Um, and so I wanted to get over the passing of the time, which I think is also something that happens when you start to approach your 30th. It's not really something you appreciate when you're at 20, um, because you're still thinking about getting to 21 and being of legal drinking age, and you're not really like appreciating time because you're just young and perfect and flawless, right? And nothing can harm you. But um, when you get to 30, I think we universally as people, like that tends to be kind of the adulting age. It gets mm -hmm. to be the first point where you realize, you know, the passing of time, like now you're decades into this life, you're getting to the point where things are expected of you. Maybe you had expectations of yourself. Like there's a lot of reckoning that comes with the 30th. Um, for everybody, for humans in general, because of, of our timeline. Um, and so for me, this was a way to keep distracted instead of overly going into my head and thinking, you know, I'm aging, I'm getting to be 30. What have I done? What haven't I done? What do I still need to do? You know, am I where I want to be comparing myself to others, all of those things that we're prone to. Instead, I was so distracted because I was like, okay, I have to take my next trip in like less than 30 days. And I have to figure out and plan for the hotels and get the best deal and find the best flight things and figure out how I'm going to afford this. And so I don't have time to be anxious over this big milestone birthday, over the passage of time generally, over societal expectations, because I'm really busy trying to meet this kind of amazing race type of deadline that I've set for myself to celebrate my birthday. And I'm enjoying it while I'm going. So it's like all of the benefits of planning a trip on steroids, because when you have a trip to look forward to, you're excited about it. Just looking into things makes you happy, not even going on the trip itself, just planning for it, getting your outfits, you know, making your reservations, doing your research, watching YouTube videos on what you're going to do. Like it's all part of the process and the anticipation and, and it releases all of those endorphins and, and joy in you. And so I was able to have that compounded like one thing after the other, like now I have this next trip to look forward to immediately. Um, and it got to the point where it really just built on one another uh, to the point where I was doing two trips a month. And at the end, I ended up doing 20 trips in 12 months total um, with a lot of really unique stops that I wasn't expecting. I went to my first travel blogging conference uh, in April in Huntsville, Alabama, which is not where I expected to end up uh, as I'm filling up my schedule with like South of France and Thailand, like Huntsville, Alabama. Um, right. And, and that was such a pivotal trip for me because it showed me that I really enjoyed the business of travel writing, travel blogging, that I wanted to make this a career, that I actually looked forward to that conference in a way I had never looked forward to legal conferences before. I attended and I was present and I paid attention and I was running in between sessions in a way I had never, ever, ever in my life done with legal conferences. Like you would not catch me rushing to anything at a legal conference. When I get there, I get there. If I miss it, I miss it. <laughs> I want to get back to the 12 for 12. Did you know where you're going? Did you plan it out? Like what, how unpack this? And then what are one or two moments in that trip or people you met 
experiences you had that were so impactful, so meaningful for you that you were like, I'm doing this wrong. This is what I want to do. This is where my joy comes. This is where I'm feeling my true authentic self. Yeah. Um, so twofold question there. I kind of want to start with the joyful moments. Um, just because I did have a few of those, like there was a moment where I was in Cuba and I was uh, just dancing along to the guitarist on the rooftop of a restaurant and and really having full appreciation for a, how scared I had been to go to Cuba, having gone to college in Miami and so many, hearing so many horror stories about people being barely able to escape the island, um, it being my first like communist country, it being my first place that I was going to that had really strict travel restrictions and things of the sort. Um, so I didn't know what to expect going there. And so a deep appreciation for myself for tackling that fear for, you know, how many liberties we take for granted just from being able to connect to internet easily to, you know, having everything available to purchase and, and realizing that while I was there, um, just the abundance in which we live and, and how lucky I was to have been born just a few hundred miles over, you know, from Cuba and in Puerto Rico where I was because I could have really gone either way. So I think it gave me a lot of appreciation for the freedom that I have as somebody who as an American can travel almost anywhere unencumbered uh, and can do so in a way where all I really need is a passport. I don't need, you know, a big folder full of documents. And that's something I never take for granted because I am a Hispanic woman. I am a minority, you know, 50 years ago, this maybe would have been a whole different story. So to be me in this moment in time um, and to have been born where I was and have this immense privilege just by virtue of being and existing right now, um, it just is, it's really humbling and it makes you feel like I almost have an, an obligation to everybody who came before me and didn't have those same freedoms to really fully explore it. Like I'm definitely the first person in my family that has traveled so extensively. My mom, you saw the first time going to Europe was with me before that. My mom, my grandma asked me, you know, if Australia was next to London, because she has no idea geographically where anything is. Uh, and so I feel like being the first person to finally get that chance and opportunity in a long line of people that have maybe been fighting for me to have this opportunity that I owe it to myself and to all the other women who can't necessarily travel in the same way to go and live life to the fullest. And, and that moment of pure joy uh, out in this country where so many people are fearful of, I think really reminded me of that and, and the power of travel and, and changing perspectives. Um, so that was definitely one one moment. Um, I would say maybe an, another moment was when I was, and I talk about this in my TEDx talk, where I, I got invited by a family, an Italian family, when I was in Greece to go in, in their car and their vehicle with them to go uh, monastery hopping and see the different monasteries in Meteora and how, you know, you're typically advised against getting into vehicles with strangers, uh, but how this family had been with me all day and how quickly they adopted me as one of their own, had me, you know, basically in the backseat with their children and were really treating me like I was was part of the family and that showed me how connection can be made despite language barriers despite age barriers despite you know societal differences I was this weird American they were a very tight-knit Italian family uh and they were just so quick to easily bring me into their fold and, and easily bring me in as one of their own and, and show me around and, and take me around and and make me feel welcome and I've had that feeling so many times since then because that is you know that universal sense of hospitality and wanting you to leave with a sense of of good memories and 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 of no regrets for having gone there. So I found that there were so many moments that really left me grateful for everything that the world had to offer and made me a lot less cynical than somebody who maybe working in law all the time would be. Well said. I mean, it seems like you, you're just you're you're so open to like people are inherently good people around the world versus the what we hear on the news or what they say on social media and you're experiencing that wholeheartedly and getting a chance to kind of dive into that second side of that like the, the 12 for 12 so did you know where you're going to go did you kind of have this thing mapped out or you just kind of figured some of it out on the fly 
I knew I had certain experiences that were on the quote unquote, like twenties bucket list. So I knew I wanted to go to the South of France and see lavender fields in full bloom, because that's something that I think as much as you, there are places in the U S that can replicate it, but it's not the same as just seeing like fields of purple and the scent of lavender and just being out in the middle of the sun. And, and for me, that seemed like paradise kind of heaven on earth. And it was this beautiful place that I wanted to take myself to, to experience. Um, So, and I knew that that was peak season so it's a set time you have to go to see the lavender um it's you know an expensive time to go to france so that required advanced planning and i had started planning that already from january for uh july and then uh beyond that i I really did go where the deals took me and also some seasonal things i will say i also ended up in the grand canyon around the uh around the beginning of April, because that's when in Antelope Canyon, which is adjacent in Arizona, the light beams come in for the slot uh, canyons there. And you can see the really beautiful pictures that maybe some people recognize from their wallpaper on their laptop. Unpack something here for me. You're so vast with your interest and your knowledge from lavender fields to the light in Antelope. So where besides just this wonderfully curious mind like where does all this also come from is there is there some sort of other inspiration that has like been just kind of planted seeds for you or is just you're just have always been curious in nature in i don't know where, tell me more yeah i just love doing cool things and so it really um if i see it i'll get it in my mind and then i'll kind of make a note for it and go back to it i just came back from Uh, Guatemala that I went to because I wanted to eat the pizza that was made on the volcano there. Uh, So I just, I saw it once and I was like, pizza on a volcano, that sounds really fun. And then I looked into it, contacted the uh, volcano restaurateur and he uh, set up a tour for me, picked me up. And then I went and I took myself out there. It was incredibly windy uh, and the pizza was delicious. And I remember, you know, on a Monday afternoon being like, this is a really cool Monday. This is a really cool way to spend the day. I'm really glad that I brought myself here just to do this. Um, But it doesn't just have to be nature focused. It's just anything cool that calls my attention. I love that you said on a Monday. I love that you said that. You've said multiple times that I could hear you remind yourself like being present in that moment. Like, hey, this is where I am. Like, I'm not in office. I'm where I am. And like, I'm, I'm curious and like, you know, from your book and all these other things that have started to happen to you, you know, working with tourism boards and other books coming out, book deals and huge social following, writing for all these publications. Is there something that you have as a routine or, or something you do to keep reminding yourself to, to be in that moment as opposed to make it move or I'm, I'm working or whatever that looks like? Yeah, I think travel is it for me. And that's why I made it my job because it was the only time I've ever learned to be present. Maybe sometimes yoga. But I actually have had a really hard time with being in my own head, Um, very anxious, and I think a lot out into the future. And so I loved travel just because by virtue of being somewhere new, you have no choice but to be in the present because you're smelling new things, you're seeing new sights, you're tasting new flavors, you're hearing new noises, like every sight and every sense of yours is is on edge and it's actually like receiving new stimuli so you can't just immediately zone out I mean you can I've had that ability and my my mind is able to still go and panic somewhere else but it's really hard because you're being stimulated in the moment you're there in the moment trying to process all of this new stuff that's being thrown at you so it gets you out of your own head and into the present and that's why I love travel because it's like my number one way to actually just feel wow, like this is really great. And this is amazing right now. And I don't have to reach this goal first to be happy, or I don't have to, you know, figure out this problem first, I can just enjoy this very moment. And this very moment is cool. And this very moment is really awesome. And I'm just happy to be here. And so that's what I found that I loved about travel and that that travel triggered in me and that I wanted to make more frequent because I realized that I was always happy when I was on trips, but then I'd come back and I'd get back into my own head, back into my own daily problems. Uh, and then I think my brother had joked with me one time and was like, well, why don't you just travel all the time? And I was like, well, why don't I just travel all the time? I'm like, that is a great idea. Um, and I realized, you know, that that is difficult nomading it and, and really traveling all the time is tough and not for me. I ultimately do need to have a home base, but having a trip to always look forward to, um, having something like that where I feel like 
routinely I am jerked back into how amazing my life really is when I stop thinking about all the problems and the places where I'm not, because I think we all do that no matter where we are. We keep thinking about where we still want to be, what we haven't achieved. And travel allows you to just realize how like right now, where you are right now is really awesome. And this moment in and of itself is kind of perfect already. And you don't need to do anything to it. You don't need to be more than you are. You can just exist in it right now and realize that that's kind of part of 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 what it's all about, right? That's what life is made up of are these little moments and, and memories. And um, I think if you collect enough of those, then you have a really beautiful fabric of life to look back on. Yes. Yes. When, um, when, when I've taken one of my, my bigger trips, like about when, when I bought my one-way ticket, I started having this saying when I, I'd record myself and I'd say like every day, this is the moment right now that is the best moment, right? And like just the reminder of that for yourself. You did mention a couple of times about why should, why can't I just travel the whole time? And if, if, you know, having a home base. So how do you incorporate those feelings, those experiences, those moments of full gratitude, being your true authentic self, being super present? How do you bring little things like that into your daily life? Because I'm, I'm a big proponent of, yeah, we are our true authentic self when we are traveling. But if we look back at what that definition was, and we kind of look at it differently, how do you then try and incorporate some of those things in your daily life when you are not traveling somewhere, whatever that would look like? Yeah, it's uh, it's not easy. And I, I think it, there's a temptation to travel more, but for me, it's it's just the logistics of it all. Like I like big souvenirs. I just bought a cuckoo clock. There's only so much I can do with a cuckoo clock. I can't come along with me, you know, and I, I want to hang it up. I want to pull the levers on it. I want to like see it work. I want to oh, see gosh. it do the cuckoo thing, you know? Um, and so I want it hung up on a proper wall to admire this. It's like German mechanics, how they make the actual, you know, there's like three different things going on at once. Um, so it's just fascinating to me. I have Tur a Turkish rug that I just bought. I want to walk on that sucker, you know, like that's like, I don't want to have it just rolled up. So for me, it's, it's having the ease of being able to display my souvenirs of having a routine when it comes to fitness and, and, uh, community and friendships and things like that. But, um, I, I do think that it's, it, I, if I could, I, I would travel more because I do think that there is that sense of a high and, and a low when you come home, that that crashing sense from a vacation. Um, so I definitely do things to try to get into a positive mindset and routine when I'm home. I start every morning off. I don't listen to the news. I don't have a TV in my room. Um, so I do like a positive audio something because I do like audio. Um, and I equate it to the same way people would maybe listen to the radio or something on their drive into work. Like for me, it's kind of how I start my day, but it'll be a positive audio book, a positive podcast, something productive. Usually during the week, it's relating to business. So money mindset or tips or like launching tips or things like that. Um, during the weekend, it'll be something related to personal development. So mood management, um, you know, manifestations, you know, healthy things, things like that. Um, and I kind of just vary that up. And then I, I do about an hour of that in the mornings just to start my mornings off on a positive note, thinking productively. During that time, um, probably beforehand, the night before, I've already sit, sat down and had like a list of what are the main things I want to get done in that day. And I know what my priorities are so that when I have energy, I can tackle it firsthand. Um, um, I do try to incorporate some kind of nature into my day. So either walking, um, jogging, going on a particular hike. Um, sometimes we have free yoga in the mornings where I am. It's not the best for fitness classes where I am, unfortunately. And I am considering a move to get some more of those conveniences. And that lifestyle is a big part of it. But I definitely try to have some kind of activity or a reason to leave. Because since I write all day, I will just be there from sunrise to sunset in the same position, like hunched over unless I break it up myself. And so I try to have that. I try to have, you know, in the afternoons, like now where I do podcasts or community things or attend a different meeting or something to connect with people, because I think our community as digital um, people is very spread out. It's not the same as going into an office. You have a community of friends and, and colleagues that are all over the world. So I try to keep in touch with them somehow. We have different virtual activities, different meetings, different things that I partake in. Um, yeah. And then usually I, I try to set goals at night, set like gratitude lists at night. So what am I grateful for today that is 
just relating to me. I think that's a big self-confidence practice because you can be grateful for so many things that are relating to other people, but like, what are you grateful for with yourself? So I'm grateful that I had the strength to carry up all those groceries on one term. Like, yeah, go strong me. Look at how good I am at, you know, carrying things. 80 year old Jen is going to really miss that strength, you know? Um, And just try to acknowledge the different positive things about myself before I go to bed and then make a list of what are the things I want to do the next day. Awesome. See, you, you totally just created that whole little outline there of what those moments are that you do create. So thank you for sharing that. I, I really appreciate that. But cuckoo clock, I love this. I love that you have these little things where it's the rug or the cuckoo clock that like, are those hits of dopamine, right? You see it come out and you're like, I remember that moment. I can experience that. I am. I, you brought the, the dopamine hit up earlier and like, I love that. You know, there's, there's, I found there's only two things that happen when you hear travel stories. You either have that thing that connects with you and resonates with a st- experience you've had or I've had, or you want to go there and you want to listen to it. So what do you think has been your most meaningful trip, interaction, conversation with someone? Is there something that you look at that has brought you to where you are today? Yeah. I mean, I think there's so many, it's hard to pick any, just one. I, I try to not leave any one place without having some kind of interaction like that, or really searching for that connection and, and having something more in Cuba, for instance, before I left, it was a time with a taxi driver where he just looked at me very sincerely and said, you know, like, I wish I could do what you do. Um, and how humbled that made me feel because he was like twice my age and how thinking about how much I take for granted especially in the travel blogger con, you know, context where people are like, how many countries have you been to? I've been to 300. How many have you been to? Three? Oh, no. Uh, and so like, I think we're always looking to do more. And so that made me feel so appreciative just for whatever my number count was then, like just the fact that I felt like I had the ability to go and explore the world without bounds, like, whereas he just looked at me so earnestly and really wanting to trade places and, and really would give me anything for that opportunity to have that same kind of freedom made me feel very humbled. Um, you know, there have been moments where I've been, you know, in, in Angkor Wat in Cambodia, where I took a private tour there. And I had my guide who was explaining to me all the different um, ways that they change the monuments, depending on who the religious leader is. And if it's Hindu or if it's Buddhist, then how they change the carvings around. And I just remember marveling at the awe of like the world's biggest religious complex and how some national parks in the U.S. will get more visitors than this place does. And how I was able to come and see it for sun sunrise but also have this experience of driving around in this air-conditioned vehicle with these ice cold towels and having this man explain to me like everything perfectly uh for like a hundred bucks for the day and it was like this most vip tour i've ever had um and you know it was like just learned so much and he's like going around explaining to me the carvings taking these you know amazing pictures and and that really made me realize too how maybe some places on earth aren't as appreciated or really Mm. seen for what they have to offer um, and how so many people will go towards one experience, not realizing how much more there is to see beyond that initial um, kind of facade. Uh, So with Angkor Wat, they go for the sunrise, but not realizing how vast the complex is beyond that. You can spend days exploring the temples. Um, And so, yeah, I think there were a lot of moments where I had local connection and I realized how lucky I was to do what I do and that I learned something I didn't know before that I now can put in my Rolodex of memories so that whenever I am traveling in the future, I can easily pull them up and be like, oh yeah, uh, you have this connection here. Oh, hold on. Let me pull up what I know from that. Oh yeah, I know this too. Um, and it, it feels so cool to me to collect those moments, those those people to be able to make those recommendations. So if somebody's like, I am going to Cambodia, I want to do a really cool private Jeep tour with ice cold water, you know, and things like that, um, I can connect that and I can, you know, help those people's businesses as well. So it all really comes full circle and it's, it's a, it's a great experience. It's a great profession. Yeah. And that would have been really great to know about because my, my, uh, my tuk-tuk driver in Cambodia did not have air conditioning or cold towel. So, you know, where were you on that one? No, um, <laughs> <laughs> it was still a great tour. I had an amazing time. Highly recommend everyone going to San Reap. Um, you know, so your your first, not, well, the 12 for 12 was more like this puzzle piece. It was more like this coming of age. It was this milestone for you that really kind of shifted you on a lot of big levels. You, you've mentioned, you know, a couple of places posting, you have a book deal, you have a new book coming out, but you've actually said a few times in our conversation here about obligation 
And even talking to the cab driver in Cuba, or I'm sure you get hit up all the time by young girls who, who look at you. What is, is your new book a reflection on that? And do you see this obligation? I don't know. How, how do you, I guess, discuss that in, in this new context of where you are as a professional now that you travel for a living? Yeah, I think the book discusses obligation in a more general gender societal sense and what the obligations are for us as women to be perfect, to have it all, to reproduce by a certain age. You know, I'm now just turned 35. I'm officially in my geriatric pregnancy years. Uh, and so these are, but these are the things that women think about, right? So these are these general societal pressures, societal expectations. I The book does not tackle this new phenomenon that I've been dealing with, which is the expectation of being somebody whose life is public. Uh, and I think that we see that with a lot of different, you know, people. Now there's influencers, there's now social media has made a lot of people's lives public, reality TV stars, things like that. Um, and I'm certainly nowhere near at the level of a regular, you know, A-list kind of celebrity, but I am at the point where I have to be careful what I say. I have to be careful with how I portray myself. I have to be careful with the message that I'm sending. And I do feel like people are watching. And so because of that, there's some sense of, well, what's going to perform well? Um, what's going to make people feel uncomfortable? What can you share? What shouldn't you share? I had a very difficult um, kind of holiday season and, and I really struggled with how to best share that because it was at a time where I was also traveling a lot. So I still had to get content. So I still had, you know, partnerships and deals that I'm part of. And there were pictures where I'm putting on sunglasses because my eyes are swollen from crying and, you know, I still have to smile and take these pictures. And so I think that that's a whole different, a whole different mental health thing to deal with, with how you can be your authentic self with inspiring others while also kind of maintaining your business. Cause I know everybody's like, Oh no, we want to hear it. We want the tough moments. But when you have an inspirational brand, like my brand is built on inspiring people to travel. My brand is not built on, you know, big um, therapy shifts or, you know, like I'm not a therapist brand or anything like that. And so while I do think that travel is a great way to help shift something internally and within yourself, and it's definitely been one of my most used mental health tools, I, I still think that it's a field where predominantly people look to for inspiration the same way they would fashion is people want to see these beautiful places. And it comes, it becomes difficult to talk about um, what we as humans sometimes go through in the process of uh, displacement when you're somebody that's, you know, nomading and, and feeling like you don't have a home or lack of close relationships or a lot of things that really a lot of people face. Um, but it can feel difficult to confront because you want to be, uh, you want to be inspirational, you want to be the person that people know you to be. Um, and so I think that there is sometimes a disconnect. I personally share a lot of this on my Facebook page with my personal group. Um, I kind of have friends that I've made from all over the world and it's the one and actually my Facebook was hacked over the holidays too, which kind of tackled on to everything else that was happening because it was really impacting my business. I couldn't log in through Instagram anywhere or anything like that. And I realized what I actually missed the most was having that safe platform where when I felt like things weren't going well, I could go on Facebook and have these supportive friends and groups of people from around the world that would, you know, support me and that I could kind of be vulnerable and honest with. And I found like LinkedIn was not the platform to do that. And Instagram was not the platform to do that. And Twitter was not the platform to do that. Um, and so I really missed Facebook when it was hacked just because of that, just of having that community where I could be like, this is honestly how I feel today. Um, and I think that, that I've gone to the point where that community is used to me sharing openly and, and responds really well to it. But there's something to be said with how you show up and how you quote unquote, like perform on all these different platforms as somebody who makes that your living. Um, and I think that that's, yeah, some, a big topic. So, I mean, as, as much as obviously travel has been super transformational for you, right? It shifted everything in who you are as a person and as a professional, you're still very cognizant and very, I don't say calculated, but very sp specific about where you do and what you do share. And especially for the business stance of, of the lens of here you are as your business and professional, but if you want to be a little more personal, you have certain outlets that you go to versus just kind of like some of the people out there just will, you know, rant and rave on everything. You make sure you kind of keep this balance between personal business on some travels. 
Yes, because um, there's a lot of things that can happen, especially when you're working or you're partnering with people, uh, especially as a woman. I, I've had instances before where I'm partnering with a hotel and let's say like the manager, the leadership of it is being weird, especially when you're in a foreign country, they can come off like, you know, where you can get kind of countries where you get engagements within the first five minutes of landing. And so it feels awkward when you have like management kind of coming on to you through WhatsApp or things like that. Um, but also at the same time, you want to promote the hotel because the hotel didn't really do anything wrong. And like the management, it's like kind of sketchy, but also kind of is it culture? I don't know. And so there's always these weird lines to cross in terms of I'm here to promote things. Um, I don't want to discourage people to come to a certain country, especially because everybody's experiences are different, especially because I've had mm -hmm. unsafe moments in the US, you know, all mm -hmm. over the place. So I, I don't want to paint a country in a bad light. And I don't then want to be like everybody says, oh, we're never going to that country because Jen had this one experience. So it, it is a, a, a line to cross between I want to promote what I do feel is worthwhile. And I want to do so in a way where I can give people a heads up on what they can expect and how they can best get along when they're there. Um, but I also want to do so in a way that isn't harmful to the country and understanding that every place is going to be different. Not every place is going to be what I'm used to from the U.S. And they, that's good. That's a good thing. In a lot of places, you know, not every place is going to have mass shootings or any, um, all these other things that the U.S. has. So I think that there's good and bad to traveling, but I'd like to portray that in a way that's balanced and still gives people a heads up without necessarily mm, making people fearful of going to that country period because I don't think that you should be fearful of going anywhere I think it, you should know what you're going into so that you can best you know prepare yourself and act when you are there I think you said I think you said it was your brother who said why don't you travel all the time um where were you when the moment came where you came up with the idea of Jen on a jet plane and tell us about I guess what's coming up not necessarily next but what is your vision for what you continue to do yeah, so that actually the name, it was, it was a whole brainstorming session with a friend of mine. It was in uh, summer of 2016 that it came about. My challenge was in 2017. Uh, we were just playing around alliteration, you know, trying different names. I had actually rebranded twice. It was at first uh, 20schic.com about like being in your 20s and young and trying to like be fabulous while working. I obviously am not in my 20s anymore, so that did not last. So fabulous, uh, by the way, so fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. And then <laughs> uh, after that, it was what's Jen up to? Because I knew I wanted it to be experiential based. But then my wonderful little brother would laugh at me all the time. He's like, if I ever want to know, like, what's Jen up to? I'll just go to what's Jen up to.com and I'll be able to figure oh. it out. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> So I was like, that's not going to work. Um, so Jen on the Jet Plane was born. Uh, it was born before, I, you know, it ended up just being a happy coincidence that my first book actually ended up being about affordable flights. So it was on the jet plane theme um, that I actually do travel a lot. I live on an island, so I do have to fly to get places. Um, unfortunately, teleportation has not made its way to me yet, but fingers yes. crossed. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and, and that's how the brand got started. And then some of the things I have in the in the works for the future. Um, so I've been doing this now full time for the last five years. I quit my job in April 2018. Um, and do you still do some law at all? Do you do anything in that space? I do not. I've had some requests to, but right. my um, licenses are inactive. I would have to right. be active again, yep. um, probably do some continuing legal education, things like that. Um, and also it just doesn't interest me. I feel like if I'm going to be sitting and like, I could maybe do appeals or something, but if I'm going to sit and write a 12 page paper. I can write other things that I can monetize. <laughs> I can write travel articles. Um, I could just write other things. I just yeah. didn't, I don't, I don't enjoy it. Um, so no, I don't still do it. I know it surprises a lot of people, but no, I don't do law at all. Um, and so some things I have up in the horizon include my first traditionally published book deal, which is 12 trips in 12 months. Thank you so much. It's with Blackstone Publishing and it is set to come out. Actually, the cover will be out this fall. The book itself will come out next summer. Um, so be on the lookout for that reveal. We're working on it as we speak. Um, very excited about that. Hopefully encouraging other people to take their own travel challenge. Mm. Um, 
also working heavily on the blog again now um, after a little bit of a break during the pandemic and working on so many other things, social media, TikTok, things like that. Um, so I'm looking forward to publishing all the content, outstanding content from all these places I've been like Jordan and Ireland and Qatar and um, recently Guatemala. So with the Volcano Pizza. And so I want to get all these articles published out there so people can plan their trips. Uh, and then hopefully when the book launches, I've been looking into doing, I, I've been asked for it a lot. Um, and so I don't know necessarily how it's going to work out, but I'm seeing if with the, when the book launches, I can have some tours that are done in the itinerary of the book, uh, some of the same places that I went to in the book. And then I don't know about necessarily me leading the tours fully as a solo female traveler. It's a little bit hard for me to do, um, but I was going to do kind of like a global book tour and sign up, uh, show up to all the tours and do a book signing, something of the sort. So that's something I'm working on for 2024, 2025. So Oh, amazing. Any travel stories that either you've never told or you haven't thought about in a long time that maybe from our conversation here, something was sparked that you were like, you know, I forgot about this. Is there anything that like maybe we, we you know, could touch on? Um, I feel like there's so many travel stories. I did think recently about the Jamaica birthday. It's been a while since I've talked about the Jamaica birthday. Oh, but... yes, the Jamaica birthday. Yeah, so I did have a birthday where I went to, this was when I was still in law school, um, but I went to Jamaica on a cruise with some friends and actually on the port at Ocho Rios where everybody went to the waterfall, we ditched the cruise and we, and we ditched the cruise people. Uh, <laughs> And we took a taxi and went to a local Jamaican bar where next thing you know, um, they are like sacrificing the chicken right then and there for me and making me fresh chicken, um, like fresh, delicious chicken, uh, birthday chicken, like braiding my hair, I have like Jamaican red stripe beer and just like hanging out. Um, and so I was thinking about that as one of the local moments where you were talking about where it's something you didn't expect. I think a lot of people would have thought it's dangerous to go. Uh, you're going to be in a residential neighborhood. What's going to happen there? And we had such a great time. I have a picture somewhere of like me and um, a group of Jamaican people from the bar and we're all standing outside of the bar like posing and I have like my hair done and like eating the chicken and uh, and everybody was just being really kind and wishing me a happy birthday and, and really trying to be as welcoming as they could be and so those kind of little moments where you're not really sure what to expect but it comes out being way better than what you could have planned definitely way better than anything on any cruise trip excursion um, where it would have been you know standing in line with 100 people to see the one waterfall uh, and so I just think it's worth it to put yourself out there. And I do, you know, I don't want to say that I believe the best in people to my detriment. I do try to be realistic about where am I going? What safety measures am I taking? And especially if I travel solo, sharing my location, having my itinerary planned ahead of time. Um, but I do think that there's something to be said for believing that people want you to have a good time. Like I think mm. more so than not, every nobody wants you to leave their country and be like, that was awful. I hate it there. I'm never going back there. I mm. won't recommend it to anybody. Like people want you to leave and be like, hey, that was pretty cool. I'm really glad I came. Like I had no idea. If anything, this past week when I was in Guatemala, that was what I kept telling people because people were like, how'd you end up here? Uh, locals that would see me would be like, what happened? What brought you here? And I'd be like, I actually... Like, this is my mistake. Like, I had no idea how much there was to see and do here. I cannot believe I only came for five days. Clearly, I have to come back. And you could see whenever I talk, they would just fill up with so much joy and pride. Right. Um, and they would just like, afterwards, they would ask me to take pictures with them and their family. They would come and give me hugs. Like, they would just be so excited because they would want you to leave with a good impression. Nobody wants you to come to their country and say it was awful. They want you to mm -hmm. say, wow, there were so many things about this place that surprised me. I can see why. I, you know, you're, you're happy to be from here. You're so lucky to have such a beautiful place to call your homeland. Um, and I think that that, the more that you come with that energy, the more that you'll actually be surprised that you find things that fulfill it and meet that. Um, that's not to say that you go and be naive and, and that you act, you know, unsafe and make dumb decisions and go out drinking at night by yourself, looking vulnerable. Um, you know, I do a lot of research ahead of time. I'm very well aware of where I am and what I'm doing. Um, but I, I give places a chance because I really think that there's a lot of beauty to, to find out there and, and good experiences. I do like that you've brought up multiple times about your research being smart. And I like that you, you pepper that in there, but there's the other side of like, you put Jen on a, on a tour, there's a good chance she's going to try and go this way. And if the tour goes right, she's going left to figure it out, which by the way is okay. And I, and I do love that, you know, it's one of those things that you're bringing up again, you're, you're, you're smart, you're, you're, do your research, you're safe. But it's also one of those things that, hey, you survive, you got the story to tell. And I'm not saying it's it's not, you're not going to survive because I'm not trying to be completely like Debbie Downer, but 
it's, you know, everything great happens on the other side of your comfort zone. It's like the silly thing to say that way. It's like, you have the story to tell about this bar in Jamaica, or whatever that looks like. And that's, that's great. I'm not, and, and look, getting off the tour is not for everyone. Sometimes getting to the tour is their, is their Mount Everest, right? And we've said, you know, travel, and that's one of my favorite things. Travel is different for each of us. You go to Jamaica, I go to Jamaica. We have different experiences, but we have the same kind of universal connection about what that could have been and what that moved for us. So there's something really beautiful within that. Um, you know, again, we, we know that if we're going to go on a tour with Jen, I, one day you and I will be on some tour trip and I'm like, she's going to totally ditch all of us. Don't worry. She's going to be going, <laughs> don't worry about it. Follow her later. <laughs> uh, dang, I'm totally traveling with you. Figure out where things are. Let me ask you this question. What does travel mean to you? Yeah, uh, I think it's really interesting because when you when you say that, I do think a lot about people who feel shamed because they want to travel in a regular tourism kind of way. Like they want to go to Paris and see the Eiffel Tower. Oh, no. Like, no, I don't think there should be ever any shame regarding the way that you want to travel. I've done it all. I've done traveling on my own. I've done traveling on a tour. I've done traveling on like a group. I've done traveling, you know, kind of figure it out myself. Like I've done all kinds of different types of travel and there's no right or wrong way to do things. You should absolutely applaud yourself just for taking yourself beyond your own city beyond your own state you know to someplace different that's amazing and incredible and there's no wrong way to do that um so for me travel just means that travel means being open to having new places and experiences that you actually um that become a part of the broader fabric of your life and your story and so that doesn't have to mean going far but it does have to mean doing something new something that you haven't thought of doing before and then an example of that for me is um, before I started really traveling for birthdays on my 26th, I, I flew a plane for my 26th birthday, uh, ironically also for Jen on a jet plane. These things have just come together that hadn't been planned. Um, but I, that was how I marked that day. And I remember feeling like, wow, this was something really unique and distinctive. And even though it's right here in the same city that I've always been in, just doing this different thing helps me see this whole city in a new light lit or, and literally like from above, um, and with the sun, you know, and in a different, a whole different way. So I think it's about making yourself uh, have moments and experiences that make you feel, that make you be present and that add to your Rolodex of memories. Uh, and I think that that's, that's what travel is, is for. That's what it's, it's meant to do so that at the end of your life, you have these beautiful, you know, things that you can look back on and, and pictures that you can see and, and remember of when you did that, when you were bold enough to try that and rappel down that mountain or take that mountain bike or, um, you know, jump in the back of that car with the Italian family, whatever the case may be. Um, those are the moments that you look back on afterwards and that you, you're really happy that you did. So travel is, is, is that it's a, it's a way of marking the moments and of making time uh, worthwhile. Yes. Jen on a jet plane. I love it. You're just dropping knowledge and in, in incredible stuff here. I love it. Hey, we're going to play a quick speed round. How's that sound? Sounds good. All right, so we're going to put about 60 seconds on the clock starting now. What is your current country count? 40. Place you still want to visit? Bolivia. Place you tell people to visit? Jordan. Window or aisle? Aisle. Mountains or beach? Beach. Airbnb, hotel? Hotel. Boat or train? Boat. Scuba dive or skydive? Scuba dive. Kindle or hard copy? Hard copy. Sunrise or sunset? Sunset. World Cup or World Series? World Cup. North Pole, South Pole. North Pole. Do you collect anything from your travels? Magnets. Best travel lesson? To keep it moving. The thing you need on a flight? Uh, headphones. Favorite national park? Grand Canyon. Favorite airline? JetBlue. Favorite hotel? Marriott. Favorite food? Paella. Favorite place in the world? South of France. All right. Jen, good on you for that. Tell all the good people where they can find you on the interwebs. Uh, you can find me on my website, jenonthejetplane.com, and also all across social media, TikTok, uh, Twitter, Instagram, at Jen on the jet plane. Make sure you give this amazing woman a follow. You know, I think with Travel With Me, we get a chance to talk to a lot of extraordinary people. And when I get to talk to people who have come into the travel industry from other places, I think there's a different kind of space of transformation, things that have happened. And I really just appreciate you sharing your story, your memories, your experiences that not only have this incredible 
just kind of just joy for you, but also there's this a wonderful responsibility in a great way that you are putting forward. So good on you. I really appreciate you and really just, just commend you for everything you're doing to live the best life, but also just inspire others to get outside their comfort zone. So thank you and welcome to the Travel with Meaning community. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, people. We'll see you on the open road. Peace.